Good evening, Vancouver. I hope you can all hear me. I'm just gonna check the uh, the chat box to see that you can hear me. Um, hello. Actually, I don't see anything right now. Okay, so hopefully, I know there's a little bit of a delay actually with YouTube. Hopefully. <laughs> I heard you just briefly before I stopped the stream, Joanna. Good evening. Whoops. Okay, so I need to, okay, I need to stop my own stream. Okay. Um, it's, like, it's like you're time traveling. I yeah. was in the past. Until you are in the present. Right. Hello, everyone. So welcome to the Virtual Starry Nights. It's been such great weather. So um, we, of course, we're going to have an event because... We just can't not have an event. All right, so who am I? My name is Joanna Wu. I am a faculty member at the physics department at Simon Fraser University. And with me today is Mr. Starry Nights himself, Howard Chartier. So please say hello, Howard. And Hi there. Can everyone hear Howard? I just want to make sure that the volume, his volume yeah, is Yeah, can you hear me? And if I start screaming or mumbling, uh, please let me know. <laughs> I just asked him to say, oh my gosh, it's Tranchi himself. No, oh, wow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so Howard, is, oh, I forgot to show his picture. There's Howard Chartier. Okay, great. Oi. And uh, there's that, there's his picture. And with me also um, on uh, moderating the chat are uh, Rohit Grover, who is a longtime staff member of uh, the Trachi Observatory, as well as hey, Rohit. Uh, members of the Royal Astronomical Society rob and cooper so welcome and thank you uh moderators for for helping out tonight and welcome all of you the rest of the rest the rest of you i'm so glad you're here this is going to be really fun so as you can see oh no my one of the cameras blanked out let me just <laughs> ah there it's because i had it minimized okay <laughs> So as you can see, we already have the observatory open and the telescope is pointed at something. What is it pointed at? Ah, the moon. Oops, it's moved. <laughs> because of course, so the telescope does track the movement of the stars. So the sun and moon rise in the east and set in the west just like the sun does, right? And so does the moon. But the moon is also orbiting the Earth, and earlier, when we had this up half an hour ago, the moon was right in the center, and it's now orbited away. So that's kind of fun. It's like the moon is actually moving, which you don't normally notice when you're looking from the ground. Uh, okay, so let me just bring this back. <laughs> Howard. Yes, you can go ahead and talk about the moon while I move this back. So, so Joanna and I were talking about uh, the moon before we started, and we're both kind of a little sheepish because we don't know that much about the moon. Uh, although one of my favorite craters is on that limb. Although it, this is an inverted view, is it? I think uh, is this upside down? -y? I don't think so. I think this is the correct view. I mean, it's it's the right okay, yeah. the right direction. Uh, okay, I guess there it is. So, so that there is a very indistinct crater on the, almost in the middle on the this limb one? edge. I, um, can, uh, oh, okay, so near the Terminator, there's a very pronounced one, but there's a very shallow kind of almost. You almost can't see it. Maybe I'll grab the the uh, mouse. And so it's over here. Somebody should from the Rask, or you, Josh, should correct me. This might be Mari Christian, the Sea of Crises. Is that is that? Yeah, Looks I'm not right. entirely I sure, so. but you were saying that this particular uh, feature on the moon is something that you can use to see the moon uh, wobbling a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, so the moon, this is uh, discovered by Galileo. In fact, it's called the lunar libration. So um, uh, because the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular around, the moon has a, what we call a synchronous orbit. It rotates once on its axis for exactly one uh, revolution around the Earth, um, but uh, the orbit's a little bit oval, and so sometimes it's moving a little faster in its orbit than it's spinning on its axis, sometimes a little slower. And so the Moon does this kind of rocking back and forth. And if I've got this crater right, Mary Christian, you can really see it very distinctly by eye. And as the Moon rocks back and forth, as this crater rocks towards the edge of the moon, it becomes foreshortened by perspective. And when the moon rocks the other way, it becomes more uh, more circular. 
And uh, I know about this for, for many, many years, but never actually tried to watch it myself. And one time I followed the moon for a week or 10 days after the moon, and you could really see this uh, very dramatically uh, changing its apparent perspective or size. And otherwise, it, following by eyeball, if you don't have a, like a target like that, you really can't tell that the moon is doing this vibration, this, this rocky motion. But with this thing, you really, you really can. So that's about the only crater that I know anything about. <laughs> yeah. On the moon. So you mentioned the Terminator earlier. That is the name of a famous movie, but it is also the name of mm-hmm. the the border between Love the it. light yeah. side and the dark side of the moon. And the Terminator is, is so when the moon right now is it's a pretty young crescent. What what does that mean because it just it was just new moon, which means it was between the earth and the sun. And so we saw the dark side, like, well, we, we, like, it looks dark towards us. But when the moon starts to orbit around the earth, or continues in its orbit around the earth, then we start to see the phase of the moon start to grow. And so right now it's a crescent and it's getting bigger. So the, the, the line between the dark side and the light side is called the terminator. And along the terminator, especially when you have, like, a crescent moon, um, along the Terminator is where you can see the craters really well because you can see the, because they they're they're uh, experiencing the angle of sunlight such that it highlights the the crater the shadows the shadows show you the the edges of the craters so I always really like looking at the moon because it's so so cool to see the craters up close like that. So I wasn't I wasn't um, guessing wrongly about this being Mary Christian. I just took a quick look at the uh, Atlas of the Moon. And that's that's definitely it. Uh, and so that's your that's your key to try to look for right. your vibration. All right. Very cool. So let's look at let's look at the other side of the moon. <laughs> While I'm moving it down, Howard, you want to tell us a little bit about um, the history of Starry Nights? You were the one who started this whole thing. Um, and what was your vision for Starry Nights when you first had this idea and, and began this event? It's funny. I I don't. I'm not very good at looking into the future with a plan. I usually don't have a plan. I kind of fly by the seat of my pants. And so uh, uh, I was. I started teaching astronomy in the course that you're teaching now um, in uh, 2003 or four, and I uh, taught it for a couple of years. And I thought maybe it'd be nice to take students out and look, have a look at the stuff that we're talking about in class. I would actually look at it through a telescope. So I, I persuaded the physics department to get us a, a small portable telescope. And I took it out, and I don't know, five or six or seven students showed up. And that was the very first starry night. That was in 2007, the fall of 2007. And it stayed very small for a couple of years. It was mostly just people from on campus uh, coming out. You know, uh, some students would bring out their telescopes, but it was all a very, very small thing. And what really transformed starry nights in a big way was. Um, uh, the 2009 International Year of Astronomy, that uh, was the 400th anniversary of Galileo pointing a telescope at the sky for the first time. And it was really a big deal. You, probably nobody knows about it anymore, but the IYA, the Year of Astronomy, was a big deal all around the world. Astronomy clubs and universities uh, um, would host the public nights, lectures, and, and, and so on. And uh, that really started... Uh, bringing people out from the public to come and have a look at, uh, at our little telescopes on the plaza. And uh, we formed a partnership with the Vancouver Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which continues to this day, and they would bring out their telescopes. And we would set it up on a grassy field like where the observatory is now. It was just grass back in those days. And so we would set up our telescopes there and, and, and host these informal star parties. And then from there, it actually grew yeah, into uh, what it is uh, today. And along the way, my oldest brother Lauren and his family very generously provided the funds to build the observatory. So uh, I like to say the observatory has my name on it, but I don't think of me, and you shouldn't think of me when you see the observatory, it's really my brother Lauren, his wife Louise, and his daughters Claire and Sylvie that, that uh, who are support uh, public education, science, and other things. They, they, it was their, their support that made that possible. Definitely, but certainly your vision and leadership and getting this going was also a major part of this as well, of course. Um, it all happened kind of by accident. It's really very, very strange. Even in Zeratory, it was just one thing led to another. It was a series of really kind of lucky coincidences, and there were right. delays in the development of the Zeratory. 
And at the time, some of us were kind of frustrated, but every delay ended up being good because we think the project changed in ways that none of us could have imagined when we started working on it. And so it was really it just kind of evolved organically in a way that uh, I, I really didn't plan exactly. Right, right. So I can see in the um, the chat, somebody has mentioned that this is the mirror image of the moon. And now that I see it, now that I've <laughs> scrolled down to the bottom here, uh, I can see there it. it is. It's down this the bottom. is Mary Christian. Yes, I was wrong. Okay, good. There so it, is. it was. I see so, that was, Car that yes. was Carl Miller, who, uh, past president of the RASC. Uh, right. And the guy who, when, when we host Starry Nights uh, on campus live, he's out with the telescope almost every time. Very dedicated guy. Thank you, Carl. Yes. For, for uh, pointing that out. Yes, definitely. And I believe, okay, um, I believe that this here is the Sea of Tranquility. This one, this dark spot here, it's partly uh, covered. This is the Sea of Tranquility where Apollo 11 first landed. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Let me, let me just flip this around. <laughs> the one closer to this side, this is the Sea of... Um, uh, fertility. This is the Sea of Fertility, and this is the Sea of Tranquility. If if my if my map is correct, if I'm if I'm flipping it in my mind correctly, but uh, I do remember that the the two spots that kind of look like the eyes and the man of the moon. It was always I remembered it was one of them was the Sea of Tranquility, and I always forgot which one it was. But it was um. But I believe it was this one. Uh, yes. Cool. Well, thank you for telling us about Starry Nights, and now uh, so. Usually, when we're when we're uh, doing, I mean, in non-pandemic times, we <laughs> normally have in-person Starry Nights where all of you are invited to come and look through the telescope and uh, be able to see things like the moon. And uh, but normally, uh, there's usually quite a few people, and people, you know, instead of having to stand in line, uh, the Royal Astronomical Society members have kindly. Uh, agreed to come and bring their own telescopes so that members of the public can look through their telescopes and not have to wait so long in line to see something, which is pretty amazing. But here, I guess, you know, there have been a lot of uh, pretty terrible things that have happened with this pandemic, but one silver lining in this is that we can stream online and none of you have to stand in line to see what we're looking at. So that's one one small benefit that uh, that we've been able to to enjoy um, with this online well, I think it's format. a great thing that you've done uh, to uh, reposition Starry Nights in, 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 in this way for the pandemic. And uh, you and the staffers have been doing a great job to keep this thing going. Yes, I, I mean, I can't, uh, you know, the, the staff the staff have been amazing. We've had um, several people, we've had several of the staff members host Starry Nights, including Rohit, who's right now, um, uh, on monitoring, and I see Zena here as well, who's also hosted oh, Zena. Hello, Starry Zena. Nights as well, and uh, everybody's been doing a great job. So, so I have big shoes to fill tonight, right? <laughs> you and I, Howard, have big shoes to fill tonight. Okay, uh -oh. so <laughs> who wants to look at something else? What should we look at next? Uh, the moon is really fun, but is it still? By the way, it's not actually fully dark yet. It's still, we are still within astronomical twilight here in Vancouver until something like 10 o'clock because we are so far north that the sun just, it just stays light for really long, uh, for, uh, for until really late during the summertime. In fact, even in, like I only learned this last year in June around the time of the summer solstice, like the longest day of the year, that time, like within a, a few, like two weeks or so of that date, we actually don't get proper nighttime here in Vancouver. Yeah. It was, it's absolutely, it's astonishing. I had no idea that we were that far north, but I guess we are. Yeah, so only, only astronomers like us would complain about having days that are so long and nights that are so short. <laughs> That's right. Especially in summertime. There are plenty of beautiful sites, astronomical sites to see in the summer, but you hardly get any time to see them because the nights are so short. Um, but today we have some, we have, we have a bit of darkness and we're going to see some fun things. So what should we see next? Let's see what's on my list. Okay. Oh, okay. So the first thing I want to show you is, um, is a, it is kind of just a star, but it's a cool star and I wanted to show off something. Oh, wait, maybe first, actually, before we go to that star, let's do M67. Let's do M67, and uh, it's which is a cluster of stars, 
It's, uh, it's a beautiful cluster and it is called an open cluster. Actually, while I, um, while I, or I, Howard, do you want to take us to M67 yeah. and I can, sure. so that I can talk about it? Okay, okay. go right ahead. Uh, uh. Thank you, Howard. So M67 is an open cluster. So stars are often found in clusters, not our sun. Our sun um, is, has moved away from its, the cluster where it was born. But stars are often, they, they are usually born in clusters because they're born in these clouds of gas and dust. Often you see these beautiful nebulae. Mo most of the pretty ones are visible in the summer. There's some, there's some that are visible in the winter as well. Right now we're not gonna see any of the nebulae that were, where stars are born. There actually is a really pretty one up right now, but it's too dim for us to see with this particular telescope when the sky isn't quite fully dark yet. But uh, stars are normally born in uh, big clouds of gas and dust, and so they're born together in groups, and um, in, they're called star clusters. And M67 is one such cluster, but what's special about it is that it's quite old. So it's an open cluster there are two types of clusters. There are open clusters where the stars are not gravitationally bound to each other, and then there are globular clusters where they are gravitationally bound. The ones that are open are usually very young, but this particular cluster is, uh, is an older one. So let's take a look at it. It is, uh, it is somewhere between two and five um, uh, billion years old. So that, that's actually pretty old. Most star clusters, most open star clusters are in the like the millions, maybe tens of millions of years old. Um, so two to five billion years, that's pretty old for an open star cluster. But uh, what can uh, we... Sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm having trouble with my mouse uh, scrolling in and oh, out. Yeah. I, I usually use the kind of manual buttons that move in and out. I don't... Oh, okay. Here, let me um, get back to that. I've got this all messed up. I should be there. There we go. Whoops. Let's go back that way. All right. M67. Okay, so we should be slow. Oh, we've, we're already there. Perfect. We're already there. Perfect. So let's take a look. Oh. Excuse me, we need to now. Um, let's let's view it in bin four. And I'm going to set the darks and flats. I made a ton of them and hopefully we'll be able to see something. Yes. Anyways, this this uh, this open cluster is um, approximately you know two to three to five billion years old. So it is unusually old. There, you go. there it is. Should we live stack it a little bit and adjust the histogram? Yeah. It's really pretty. There are a few uh, red giant stars in there. But how how do we actually know the age of a cluster? Does anybody know? How do we actually know the age of a cluster? It's actually kind of a, a complicated story, but but it's a really cool technique that scientists, that astronomers have come up with, and it's um it's a it, it's a testament to discovery about how how uh, stars what stars do when when they're in clusters and how they evolve. So basically, what we know is that the more massive a star is, the less time it lives. So if it's more massive it'll burn away. So what actually powers a star is a star turns hydrogen into helium in a process called nuclear fusion. And that's why stars shine, it's because they, they do nuclear fusion inside of their cores. And so, uh, so stars that are more massive uh, burn up their hydrogen a lot quicker than stars that are less massive. So stars that are, um, so they, they, they burn up their hydrogen and then they blow up into red giants. So the most massive ones eventually actually blow up after they become a red giant, then they actually explode and become supernovae. But the less massive ones 
um, turn into a red giant, and then eventually become a white dwarf. So we can talk a little bit more about that when I show you a planetary nebula. But in M67, um, there, the, what, the reason why we know how old it is is because we can see that we, well, we assume that all the stars are born roughly at the same time, and then we see that there are no more massive stars alive in the cluster, and because we know how long massive stars live, like a few million years, a few million years, then we can tell if they're not there anymore, then the cluster has to be older than a few million years. So that's roughly how, like, that's, that's kind of, you know, the hand wavy explanation for how we know how um, old these star clusters are. Okay, so what do we have here? Oh, pretty. So we can already see a few different, so this uh, camera here is a color camera, so you can see a little bit of difference in color between some of these stars. Like in the upper yeah, left so, there, that's so a pretty bright red one. Red. Although I don't know if that's so a foreground I, star. It might yeah, be a foreground. But sure. you can start of see hints of blue. And, yeah. So I'm, I'm not getting many frames stacked. I haven't played this thing for quite a long time. Oh, you are. Long, you, so you've got six frames stacked already. Six stacked. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, it is stacking. So this is good. Pretty. That's good. So the Ooh, way yeah, that... It's ignored, it's ignored none. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's, it's nothing. It's good. Keep going. Okay, so the way that astronomers, like I just explain in words how we do this, but what astronomers actually do is they, they make this diagram of, uh, like they, first of all, they measure the brightness of all the stars, and then they measure the color of all the stars, and then they plot them against each other. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a second, um, once Howard finishes playing oh, the... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay. How, no, how I'm, does that I'm look? Just, that pretty good. Hovering around. That looks pretty good. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just. Okay. <laughs> that looks pretty good. So what people do is they they make this plot of brightness versus color here, and I wanted to show off this beautiful diagram. This is called a, a color magnitude diagram. Magnitude means brightness. So a color and brightness diagram. And, um, and so what astronomers do is plot stars here. And then they know that if all the, the most massive stars have already become red giants, then they know that it must be a certain age. And I wanted to show off this beautiful diagram because this was a plot made by a student of mine, Bryce Adam, uh, in my class that were uh, in our observational astronomy class where, where he and his, his group actually took images of this very cluster and measured the brightnesses and colors of every single star in this image and made this plot. And then, then what they did was they fitted the different theoretical curves that must be, that the shape of the, they fitted the shapes of theoretical curves that have a particular age and was able to measure uh, as an age of this cluster that's about a little less than two billion years. So a little bit on the young side compared to the published value, but still a very nice fit, I have to say, a very nice fit of the theoretical that's, curve that's great. to the uh, to the stars in this cluster. So, so how many nights of, of observing did your student uh, oh, this was just, uh, do? To... This was just one hour of observing, what? actually. It wow. was not very long at all. Okay. Yeah, right. so if they had if they had observed for, maybe it was maybe a little bit longer than an hour, but if they had done more than an hour, then you would have seen dimmer stars, and then you would have seen a, mm -hmm. uh, the stars create this this line going down this way. Yeah. Because low means dim and high means bright, so the stars would have continued on uh, in a sequence here that is called the main sequence. But we don't have to worry about that. Let's actually look at the <laughs> let's look at the pretty pictures here. I wanted to show <laughs> off this this diagram from a student in my class. So uh, I have his permission, by the way, <laughs> for showing that, the, this thing. So, but let's take a look at um, the, the pretty picture. And you can see that there are different colors of stars in here. So the bluer ones will be, wait, can anybody guess? If a star is blue versus a star, so this is a little bit of a bluer star and this is a bit of a redder star. Given those colors, which one do you think is hotter, the blue or the red? Anybody? 
everybody. There's always a little bit of a delay on YouTube. <laughs> ah, crickets. Nobody knows? Is blue hotter or red hotter? <laughs> no? Here's a hint. Don't don't think of the labeling on the on the faucets in your bathroom or kitchen. <laughs> blue! Thank you, <laughs> Cooper. Blue is hotter, that's right. Blue is hotter. So think instead of a flame. A blue flame is hotter than a red flame. And that's exactly what we're um, that's so so it's in the same way blue stars are hotter than red stars. Uh, but the uh, yes, the blue stars are also uh, going to be because they're hotter. More massive stars are hotter, so the blue stars are also going to be the more massive ones. So you can see and they die first. Blue, blue, yes, everybody's now saying it. Okay, yeah, there is. Wow, there is a massive delay. <laughs> Some, between... Somebody answered Smurf. <laughs> Smurf. <laughs> 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 yes, there's a lot of a lot of delay, a massive lag between between us and you two, but that's okay. I'll try to ask a question and then chatter a little bit and for <laughs> thirty seconds or something until their answer comes up. Okay, um, so that was M sixty seven, and uh, it's a. By the way, what is the M in M sixty seven? Howard, can you explain that? So the M uh, stands for Charles Messier. He was an 18th century uh, astronomer. Um, he was a comet hunter. So this was uh, maybe just a century after Newton came up with his law of gravity. And so studying the orbits of comets in those days was very interesting because it gave a way of trying to understand what was going on in the uh, outer solar system. And so uh, it was all about finding comets. And so the way you look, find a comet is you scan the sky looking for a little fuzzy patch uh, and you uh, look at that fuzzy patch tonight tomorrow the night after and if it's a comet it will slowly change its position relative to the stars because it's moving in its orbit but uh, Messier found a bunch of little fuzzy patches that didn't change their position and so for him uh, speaking kind of loosely these are boring forget about these uh, objects they're not comets so he published this list of objects as a guide to fellow comet hunters, don't bother with these. And I think he discovered something on the order of 20 comets or so today. I don't think we remember him for any of his comets. We remember him instead for this listing made of fuzzy objects that to him were boring, which turned out to be very interesting uh, to us now that we, we know what they are. So these things are galaxies or star clusters like M67, for example. It's the 67th object in Messier's catalog. Uh, and the modern catalog has uh, 110 objects. And so uh, his fuzzy patches are considered by amateur astronomers in particular to be among the most uh, beautiful objects in the sky. And uh, if you're an accomplished amateur astronomer, then you will have seen through your telescope without computers, or, you know, finding it sort of by hand using a star chart, you'll have seen all 109 or 110 Messier objects. And having said that, I have not seen them all. I've seen probably about two thirds. Yeah, there are. But it is kind of ironical. There might be a couple that are too far south for us to see. Is that true? At least yeah, there are a few that are too far south, uh, and there's also one or two that are kind of debated as to what they are. There might be two, right. I think there's one or two duplicates, or there might, might be sort of like a double star. But um, uh, many of the objects on on Joanna's list tonight are are from the Messier catalog because they are so nice, yeah, nice right. to see. Yes. In fact, actually, because we just talked about Messier, I thought you know this wasn't on our list, but you know what? Why don't we see this? I've actually just moved us over to M3, which is oh, the cool. the very first object that was discovered by by Charles Messier. So um, let's go. Let's clear that and let's take a look at this this uh, this globular cluster. It's a glob. So I mentioned, remember, the last cluster we saw was an open cluster, and um, this cluster is a globular cluster. So. So in contrast to an open cluster, a globular cluster is gravitationally bound. Um, Sorry, I was, I was, uh, maybe you should take it. Okay, do you want to handle that while I talk about M3? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Okay. So M3, oh yeah, you can see a, a little bit of the... This one. Right. There, there, but that, okay. Let's see if I can clear the last stack. I'm just going to try that again. So, uh, yeah, go so, ahead. 
M3 is a globular cluster. You can kind of see it almost right now while, while Howard adjusts the image. Um, it, yeah. So what are globular clusters? They're actually kind of funny because they're these, they're, um, they're pretty massive. There's like thousands of stars, whereas a, an open cluster like the one we just saw in M67 is like maybe uh, hundreds of stars um, at the most. Um, globular clusters have thousands of stars and they're very, very densely packed. And globular clusters are kind of funny because unlike open clusters, which live, so, you know, okay, the Milky Way. What is the Milky Way? The Milky Way galaxy is the, the big collection of 100 billion stars where we live. It's like a, it's, it's shaped like a spiral disc, like a plate that's got spiral arms. And open clusters live in the disc of the Milky Way. They live in the spiral arms mostly, and, you know, or in between the spiral arms, but in the disk. Globular clusters, however, live in a halo that's around the Milky Way. So they live in like a spherical distribution, like there are lots of globular clusters and they kind of, you know, are in a spherical distribution around the Milky Way. So it's a, they are a little bit, they are very interesting. This particular globular cluster is about uh, 30,000 light years above the plane of the of the Milky Way. So if so, um, if you imagine the Milky Way as a plate and you put it on the table, M3 is above the plate. <laughs> it's about um, 30,000 light years above the plate and about 40,000 light years away from the center. So um, uh, approximately. <laughs> and we are. Let's see. We are eight. Kilovars so 8,000, so that's times 3 is 24. We are about 24,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. And M3 is, so is more than, or about, about twice as far away from, from the center of the Milky Way. So M3 is, uh, is a globular cluster, and as I was saying, the open clusters tend to be young. Well, globular clusters tend to be quite old. They're very old. So this one is a young for a <laughs> globular cluster. It's about 11, 11 billion years old or so. Um, uh, but uh, there are lots of globular clusters that are even older than that. So even 13, um, 13 billion years. The universe is only 13.8 billion years. And in fact, globular clusters, when, when astronomers measured the ages of globular clusters, um, using the technique that I was telling you about, you find out how many massive stars are still around, you know how long they live for, so then you can kind of infer their age that way. Uh, but when you do that, so astronomers did that a couple of decades ago and discovered and thought, oh, well, you know, they're at least 14 or 15 billion years old. And, and then people were discovering that the universe was not that old. And there was this big, you know, there was like a little bit of a, a, of a tension there that, well, how can globular clusters be older than the age of the universe? That can't be right. And it wasn't right. So somebody did their measurements wrong. And now our measurements are more accurate and now everything's consistent. The universe seems to be about 13.8 billion years old. And this globular cluster is about 11 billion years old. So how's it going there, Howard? I, I'm uh, messing around with the settings, Joanna, but not, not with much luck. It hasn't stacked uh, any frames. Oh, it hasn't stacked any frames? How can that any be? Any frames. One stack. Well, one stacked. I guess that means no stacking. Ten ignored. How can that be? Let me see if I, I have. I, I, I messed around with the settings a little bit, so maybe I'll reset those and uh, if you go from there. Um, I did take some, I don't know if I have an M3. I, I, when I, when I was, uh, you know, there are several nights when we, when we just take sharp cap or we use this camera to go and look at some things and I've taken some screenshots of the settings just so that I can remember to like, would, yes, to set idea. them again. Okay. I have the settings for this one. Let me see if, let me see if they make a difference. So 15, oh, this should be 2.5. One, 32, one, and eight. So, <laughs> screenshots are very handy for these kinds of things because if this, this camera is a little, like this, this app, well, it's, it's really nice. It's a little finicky when it comes to stacking. So what are we actually doing? What we're, we're talking about stacking, what are we doing? Well, we're taking an image and once we take an image, we want to take several more images because a single one is pretty noisy. 
and we want to take more images so that we can clean up the image a little bit. So if we take more images and stack them, then we get better quality images. Um, now, that glare in the lower right, unfortunately, is due to certain lamps around the observatory that, uh, that have been installed for people's safety. And unfortunately, safety is a little bit more important than astronomy. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it does result in a little bit of glare in, when we're looking in the east, which is where we're looking right now. Uh, we are looking towards the east. So, did we stack? No, we didn't! What? No. Those were supposed to work? <laughs> okay, as I said, it's a little finicky. This is 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Yes. Okay. That's that's really odd because because stars are so easy to identify. Yeah, she looks not bad for a single for a single frame. Yeah, it's not bad for a single frame. That's true. So one thing you could do is just turn off the aligned frames and they'll just stack on top of each other regardless of their rotation. That's so that's idea. one thing you can that's one thing that you could try. And I'm gonna try to make it a little bit no, that's good. a little glare in the in the corner there is unfortunate. Yeah, so now it's stacking because we're not aligning, but then eventually the stars will start blurring. But anyways, there you go. There is M3. M3, the globular cluster. All right. How are we doing for questions? Okay. Um... I haven't I haven't kept too much track of the questions, but I know that uh, the moderators are doing a great job, so I think I won't worry too much about that. But yes, that is M3 the Glob Cluster. Okay, so the next one I think is really cool uh, that I wanted to show you because because I wanted to show you another student's um, amazing work uh, in, in her project for the term. Um, anyways, we're going to look at a, a Okay, it's a little bit boring in the telescope, but it is a really cool star because it is called W Ursa Major. Um, and what it is, is that it's a binary star, meaning there are two stars in this system. And they are rotating around each other so close together that the stars touch and they're like sharing material between them. It's pretty crazy. But how do we know this? It's because of the light curve. It's because uh, it's because the um, the when the stars move in front of each other, um, they they actually e eclipse each other. So then their light dims and then and then brightens and dims again. So I'm going to show you this. Uh. Okay, so there it is. There's the star. It's W Ursa Major. It's actually got a little star next to it, but that is not that little star next to it. That's not it. <laughs> that's not the other star that's connected to it. But this is a contact binary system. And I'm going to show you a picture of oh, an artist's impression of what a contact binary star looks like. It's kind of like this. So these, these are artists' impressions here of a contact binary. And so this star system is very likely to be something like this. In fact, um, they're they're actually probably pretty closely close uh, in mass. This um, W Ursa Major, uh, and the reason is because when one star blocks the other from view, because they're rotating around each other, right? So when one star blocks the other from view, then uh, then the light gets dimmer, and then when they align like this, then you can see both stars and you see the light of both stars. But then when the other one goes in front of the other, the light dims about just as much, almost. So their stars are probably very similar in mass. So that's what a contact binary is, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, maybe this should be adjusted. Oh, and I haven't aligned. <laughs> so we're doing some rotation here. Okay, let's clear that and do that again. But I wanted to show you this, because I think it's cool. The idea of a contact binary, how do we know that? Well, we know that from the pattern of the stars getting the stars getting brighter and dimmer. It was quite a weird 
thing to see that the, the light was getting brighter and dimmer. And so then astronomers realized that, that the pattern can only be explained if the stars were so close together that they were in contact. So that is W Ursa Majors. And um, so some students in my class this year uh, decided that they were going to image this particular um, star, and they did. And they imaged it for an entire night from like 9 p.m. to like, I don't know, 3 or 4 a.m. <laughs> They were pretty dedicated students, and this is the plot that one of the, my students made. Now, this particular student wanted to remain anonymous, so I Very won't cool. um, I won't say who it was. I won't say that. Well, he or she should be he should be pretty proud of that curve. That looks great. It's beautiful. Look at this. Look at how 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 um, precise that is. So there's there is a gap here, and the reason is because so um, the reason is because at some point uh, they weren't paying attention and. And the dome stopped tracking, and so it start it blocked the dome blocked the um, the the image of the star, so they had to restart and and start again. But but so there was a bit of a gap. But you can still see you can still see that the curve would have continued on like this and it increased, so it got brighter and then dimmer again. So they got almost an entire cycle. It would have gone so it so this is when one star blocks the other, and then the second minimum is when the other star blocks the other. So the entire cycle is two dips. So this is a very beautiful light curve. Um, uh, so that group should be proud of themselves and the one student who made it as well. So they, um, yeah, this is a light curve. And that's how, so people, the only way to explain this kind of W-shaped light curve is with a contact binary. So that is the star. And this is what is likely, going, um, <laughs> what this, the, the binary star looks like. Artist impression. Artist impression, yes. <laughs> cool. Uh, the period, oh, what's so, the period? Uh, I, the period, it was something like um, uh, 10 hours, I think, and they, they got something like uh, six hours of it. Something like six hours of it. Well, let's see, Julian date. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, That's okay. about uh, two fifths of a day. So, uh, something like that, yeah. 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 Couple of hours. Yeah. Good choice. Good choice for uh, an object to study because yeah, uh, beautiful. having it uh, such a short period lets you map out yes. the curve in one night, which is very cool. Yeah, most of it, in any case. Yeah, so that was yeah. um, because because of the weather here in Vancouver, we could never predict whether or not we could have multiple nights of observation. So, so I told the students to try to pick a project that they could do in a single night, <laughs> and so they picked this one, and it was very successful. So good for them. Uh, Joanne, if I could just yes. interrupt for a second, I wanted to give a shout out, which I just did by text to some family members who are, who are CR tuned in from Montreal. That's uh, my brother-in-law, uh, Spo, uh, his wife, Chris, and their daughter, Zoe, cousin to my son, uh, Alexan. And uh, Zoe is currently taking astronomy in CJEP, which is kind of like uh, between uh, high school and university in, in Quebec. And apparently she's loving it, which is, I'm glad to hear. So they're, they're, they're listening in. Right. Yes. Welcome. And I see that. So post pandemic. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I see that Kelvin is here as well, who was also part of this class and also made a beautiful light curve of another type of variable star, which we weren't going to look at today um, because I did want to look at some galaxies. But, but Kelvin, you, 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 your group also made a very beautiful light curve, which I didn't, I don't have today to show off to you, but this one is, this one is W or some major. So what should we look at next? What was on the list? Okay. Oh, oh yes. I have a very, very nice little target for you. Um, one of my favorites actually, it's a little bit small, but, but it, it's still pretty, very impressive. So this is called the cat's eye nebula. So let's take a look at the cat's eye. It's kind of cool because it looks a little bit like the eye of Sauron. That's what I think of it as the eye of Sauron. Oops, I didn't slew yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look as pretty as the Hubble pictures. None of it does, right? Of <laughs> course, you have to do some processing to make it look like the Hubble pictures. Um, and in fact, actually, there I'll, we'll show you some 
that Howard and some of the observatory staff made some gorgeous, gorgeous pictures. Howard is really a master of astrophotography, so I'll we'll have to get you to talk a little bit about your techniques uh, when we get to those uh, I'm, those beautiful I'm, images. I'm not, I'm nuts about it. It uh, dominates my thinking, especially yes. these days. Yes, I've got a new scope that I'm that I've been playing with. Yeah, why don't you tell us about uh, that while and, uh, I while I get, bring up the cat's eye. So um, I, I've had a telescope in the Okanagan for about uh, 10 years. My family and I have a, a country place, we call it the cabin in the sky. You know, as an amateur astronomer, if you if you build your own observatory, you have to give it a name. And so, um, you know, many astronomers will say, I'll call there's the Aristotle Observatory, you know, or the Socrates Observatory or something like that. But I named my observatory after uh, a Bugs Bunny cartoon with uh, Yosemite Sam and Bugs Bunny where he has a cabin in the sky. So I started doing astrophotography at SFU as part of Starry Nights in the very beginning using a small portable telescope. And then I got my own telescope in the country uh, in the Okanagan, and now I have another one, a new one, that is actually uh, at a remote observatory in California, in the Sierra Nevada, outside of Fresno, where uh, a bunch of amateurs and some professionals have uh, telescopes that uh, we run remotely, and so I've been I, I I got that up and running last year. Yeah, that's so, really so exciting. In, it must be so much fun to play with it. It is. It is a beautiful scope, and so uh, ooh, look at that. Ooh, Wait, ah, just a second. I don't think I have yeah. something. I have myself saying I wrote my notes to myself. And I said I said bin, I said bin two, but I don't think this is right. Um. No, this must not be right. Okay, I'm going to go back to bin four because that was prettier. <laughs> bin four it is! It looked, it, looked, it looked pretty good a moment ago, yeah. Oh, yeah, but it, that's not, I don't know. Wait, did it? No. Yeah, so one of the things about astrophotography is uh, taking the picture is one thing, but making it look nice is a completely different thing. It's kind of a more of an art than science. So you'll see Joanna playing with the SETI settings in this program. There are many, many, many settings of finding the right combination to make the thing look at, oh, that's close, uh, is, is, takes a lot of experience. Okay, there we go. Somebody was asking about the color of M3 before, that it looked kind of yellow. Color is really tough to get, uh, especially on the fly like this, uh, balancing the color. Uh, and, and making it look, you know, kind of realistic, which is uh, also a bit subjective. Yeah, it looked, um, let's see. There it is. Now it's a little too bright this way. Oh, there we go. We well, there you go. Look at, look at the central. Dang, it yeah. looks nice. Yeah, I wanted to get a slower, lower binning, um, and I, I have a picture that I took last night that looked a little bit better than this, but <laughs> using bin two, and I don't know why it didn't work this time, but that's all right. So binning is taking the is when the electronics takes the individual pixels from the camera and groups them, like into groups of two by two or four by four. And one of the advantages of binning is that when you combine the light from a whole bunch of near nearby pixels, you make a, a brighter kind of super pixel, so the image will look brighter but you lose some of the detail by combining neighboring pixels that you would have had otherwise if you, if you didn't. So it's a balance between trying to get more detail using, say, all the pixels in the camera and trying to make the object brighter by using fewer pixels and grouping them. Right. Yeah, the binning, I used bin 2 last night and it looked great. I don't know. Anyways, this looks pretty good too. Okay, you know what? I'm going to try because that it's really great. bright and it doesn't take very long to get there. I'm going to try this again. I'm going to load bin 2 and make sure and, and try again. I'm going to just try again. Uh, clear. Well, that looks pretty good too, <laughs> but let's try again. That looks really nice. Okay, so that did not look as good. Nope. I don't know why. It did so well last night. Of course, because I was trying it out before doing this. 
And you didn't have to worry about, oh, there you go. Just trying to, to talk and image process at the same time. That's, uh, <laughs> that's asking for a lot. Oh, that's a little better. It's a little better. Let me just bring the green down. You can definitely see it's larger than uh, than before. Yeah, and we have more pixels. Not as it's not as pixelated. Oh, that's better! Hey, that look at that! So nice. Wow! Wow! Look at those little cool. thingies. Those you can see little tendrils and things. I don't know if you can. Yeah. On your, I don't know what what the stream does I, to the I, quality I, of the image, but um, I don't know if the rest of of the audience can see that. Well, I'm seeing the same thing you are, uh, Joanna. It looks it looks very nice. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, you're seeing you you are, but I don't know if people on the stream can. I don't know. I tried to set the stream to a pretty good quality, so hopefully you can see that. You can see you can see like two rings. It's pretty neat. Hey, there's the cat's eye nebula. Yeah. yeah nice. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the cat's eye nebula. Uh, I like to call it the Eye of Sauron, <laughs> but anyways, the shape. Why does it have this weird shape? Okay, what, okay first of all, what is a cat? What is the cat's eye nebula? It's a planetary nebula, and a planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets. It's just yet another one of those things. Astronomers have very weird names for things, and this is one of those. <laughs> and, like it's really true. There are so many like astronomers have real problems with naming things. It's really it's. I don't even get me started on that. But anyways, this is a planetary nebula, and it. It, the reason why it's called that is because it's about, like, if you put Jupiter right beside this, um, even though Jupiter is a lot, like, you know, this is many, how many light years across it is? I can't remember. It's many, many light years across. Um, but if you put Jupiter in front of it, which is much smaller than many light years, uh, but it's closer to us, Jupiter would be about approximately the same size. So planetary nebulae like this are about the same size as planets when you look at them through a telescope. But not if you set them beside, like if they were at the same distance from us, they of course would not be the, you know, this would be yeah, a huge. small telescope that looked like a little disc. So uh, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's why they're called planetary nebula. Okay, but what is a planetary nebula? It's when a star has, as I told you, when stars um, like the sun are burning hydrogen into helium, and that's why they shine. Um, eventually, they do run out of hydrogen in their cores. And they st and they uh, and they and they start to expand into a red giant. So if you are a star like the sun, that's like not very massive, then your red giant outer layers will because you expand into a red giant out out at the very edge of the layers. You don't really feel a lot of gravity from your star, so eventually the outer layers of the red giant will float away, and that's what a planetary nebula is. It's it's the layers of a red giant that has floated away. If you were if you were really massive, then after the red giant phase, you would turn into a supernova explosion. But this one is not such a star. This star became a planetary nebula instead. So this is this is very very cool. You can see some of the colors. Um, it's a very colorful nebula. Uh, so this particular why does it have so planetary nebulae have all sorts of shapes? And the reason is because uh, every stellar system has something different about it. So this one probably had, um, you know, is probably like a, a binary star system where the two stars are orbiting each other pretty close such, so that you would, uh, so that you would have like, um, you know, different shapes of when, the, when one of the star becomes a, one of the stars becomes a red giant and the layers, layers expand out, then the orbital dynamics creates these, this beautiful pattern here. And it also, um, their orbits, Sometimes you might get, instead of a binary star, sometimes you might get um, a, a disk of dust orbiting the star, kind of like a, like a Kuiper belt, like, um, or an asteroid belt, but bigger, <laughs> a lot bigger. And, and sometimes a, like a disk of dust like that will cause um, uh, the, the layers of the star, that, the red star giant that's expanding, um, well, it can't go through the disk, it's got to go above or below because the material of the disk is blocking. So sometimes then the disk then causes the nebula to expand into these, you know, uh, polar, bipolar jets, you know, or like these, these beautiful shapes. Anyways, this is, this one is probably uh, due to something like a binary system. But this is... Brass, so I tried uh, putting a little, a little sharpening in and... Uh, pretty. Um, 
I gotta take Let's a screenshot of that. That's so pretty. I am gonna take a screenshot. Cat's Eye Nebula. I've probably taken screenshots of tons of these, but it's just so nice to, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just looking uh, live at an object like this, it's almost like developing old fashioned film in, in, in a dark room and it comes out yeah. bit by bit. It's really, it's really impressive to see all that color and detail in just a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, it is really nice. Very this striking. is a particularly bright nebula. If you have a tiny little, if you have a small telescope, you should be able to see it pretty easily, if you know where to look, that is. <laughs> Unfortunately, here at the uh, Trati Observatory, we have software that knows where to look. <laughs> but hey, if you have, if you have like a, a cell phone or something, you can load up Stellarium or something and, um, and well, you still need to know where to look to point in order to point to this, this beautiful object. Where is it exactly? It's in the north. Um, it's the, here's the little dipper. This is the North Star right here, and it's over here. It's just down here. <laughs> so it's usually in the north. It's, it's circumpolar because, okay, remember how I told you that the sun and the moon and the stars, they all rise in the east and set in the west? Well, all the stars do that too, but they, they, they do it in such a way that they go around the North Star. So they, go, they rise in the east, and then they, they go up, and then they set in the west. But there are some stars and some nebulae that are so close to the North Star that they, they don't ever set. They just go around and around and around. So that, those types of objects are called circumpolar because they go around the pole. <laughs> circumpolar. So the Cat's Eye Nebula is a circumpolar object. So you're, you're able to see it all year round if you've got a nice clear view to the north. So let's take a look at that again. Wow, so pretty. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. How is the crowd doing? I hope you're all enjoying this. It's so pretty. Um, we can move on Lots to the conversation objects, in the chat. Where are we at? We are almost at ten o'clock, so we got another half hour. I'll turn off the sharpening. See there. Uh, that really makes a big difference. That makes a huge difference. Wow. Makes a huge difference. That's just a, one indication of the power of uh, image processing. Yeah. Yes. Photoshopping, in other words. <laughs> right? Photoshopping, yeah. <laughs> Look, the truth but nothing, is... Nothing illegal. Nothing illegal. That's right. Like, astronomical objects are just too dim to see with the naked eye, so you don't actually know what they would look like up close because they're just too dim. And so, so you have to do some um, enhancements with, with image processing. Maybe, Howard, you can talk a little bit more about that, like the whole uh, uh, idea of processing and, and the techniques that you use while I go and salute to one our of next the, target. One of the things we were talking about is color, this beautiful color in, in this object. And you often get asked, you know, are the colors real? And uh, so color is kind, of, is kind of a subtle thing in, in astronomy. Uh, so in this case, the camera is using red, green, blue filters to produce the color. It's the same kind of technology that you would use in your, say, your cell phone camera to produce color images. But one of the things is that we all sort of know what a, a red rose should look like, but we don't necessarily know what, what a red you know, nebula should look like or, or what this cat's eye nebula, what exactly what the colors, what are the right colors? What's the right, how vivid should the colors be? How saturated should they be? What's the right balance between red, green, blue? And so there are various uh, schemes you can try to adopt that would um, give you a guideline as to uh, how to choose the colors in a way that's um, you know, sort of realistic. But really, at the end of the day, in, in many of these images of amateur astronomers like, like I produce, a lot of it is, uh, is um, even if you're, you're taking the real image and you're processing it in ways that are, that are not too uh, forced or too extreme there's still a lot of choice as to how you present your object including in the colors right and speaking of which uh post-processing is really important for faint objects and <laughs> speaking of which yeah. i moved us over to um to m51 which will be a bit of a challenge oh, but let's okay. let's uh let's try to make this work uh m51 is a very dim object but 
it is possible with this instrument, so let's do it. Um, let's clear it and let's see what it looks like. And I better find my little screenshot of the settings so that I can get a good stack. Look, there's, there it is already. There it is already, and I said... Are you back on, on the bin 4? Oh, or, this uh, is exactly the settings I used. Okay, good. I also uh, used 30 good. seconds instead of 20, but maybe... T Let's see if 20 will do, and we can see it faster. Yes, it does do. Good. So, let's bring down the red. So, Howard, do you want to talk about M51? It's one of your favorite objects. Right. And so uh, this is uh, near the top of everybody's list in, in amateur astronomy land. In particular, you can already see this piece of the core of the galaxy and this little swirl that you're already seeing here and a little bit over there. These are the spiral arms of this uh, galaxy. So as John was saying, galaxies are kind of like a pancake or an island shape. They're wide and thin through the middle. And in this particular galaxy, we're looking almost directly uh, down from above, if you will, onto the, onto the galaxy. So um, today, you know, you look at a picture, well, this will get a lot better as time goes on, but, you know, you look at a picture of a galaxy, everybody says, oh, galaxy, it's kind of obvious, but uh, for centuries, you know, we were talking about Messier before, who first started cataloging uh, uh, these faint fuzzy objects. For centuries, you'll have really no clue what these things were. Uh, and um, even into the beginning of the 20th century, there was a great deal of debate. It was actually called the Great Debate in astronomy. You look at a spiral structure like this, okay, and many astronomers thought, okay, this is a star forming with uh, a disk of planets forming around the star. And so many people thought, okay, this is a star forming and planetary forming region within our own galaxy. And other astronomers thought, no, no, this is something completely different. It's its own entity far outside our own galaxy uh, and um, uh, it was uh, one of two great discoveries that were, were made by Edward Hubble after whom the Hubble telescope was named. He was the first person in history to determine uh, scientifically the distance uh, to this object and the distance to this is something on the order of 20 million light years. The nearest galaxy to us, the Andromeda galaxy, is about 2 million light years away. So this put it well outside our own galaxy. And once you know how far away this thing is, you know, how, for example, how wide it is. This is a, something on the order of 100,000 light years from end to end. So this is definitely not a single star with planets forming around it, but a whole galaxy in its own right. And that discovery was made in 1924. So not even a century ago. Before that, we had really no idea what these things were. Um, uh, and 51 is important historically for another reason. It was the first galaxy for which... Uh, astronomers were actually able to see its spiral shape. This was done by um, a, an Irish astronomer, engineer, parliamentarian named Lord Ross. And he, uh, he, he built his own telescopes, he built the world's largest telescopes at the time. And with that, he was able to gather enough light in order to be able to resolve the swirl that we see here in this picture that's emerging. And that gave rise to the name Whirlpool. So he resolved the shape and become known as spiral nebulae. And today we know these things as galaxies, but as I said, that's that's a comparatively recent uh, discovery. Uh, and this is a really favorite object. You can kind of make out the shape in, a, in an amateur telescope. And when people start shooting images like me, they, they want to shoot this thing because it's so, it's so impressive. And uh, this is the first thing that I shot with my new telescope, and maybe we'll show you that. But just, it's really hard to uh, state how amazing it is to see all this detail. Look at all the spiral arms, the dust, the lanes in the center here. In just 10 minutes of, of uh, imaging in the middle of the city, this is really uh, kind of amazing. Ah, and so here's another galaxy um, right next door. This doesn't have a Messier number. It has, it has another catalog number, but sometimes called M51b. Anyway, uh, this is a small galaxy that is being ripped apart by this large spiral. This isn't a regular galaxy. It's massively distorted by this one. And so they're in collision, and over the course of something like a billion years, these two galaxies will merge into one. And uh, the same thing is going to happen, in fact, between our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy also over the course of the next few billion years. 
toxic collisions actually turn out to be very common. So, yeah. Look at all that Sparrow stuff. So, I mean, it will stack a bit more, but as you can see, so <laughs> mentioning that we're in the middle of a city, this glare on this side here, <laughs> just so you know, is a street lamp that is just to the north of the observatory, which is rather bright. But what can you do? We are in the middle of a city. Ah, it's still not too bad, though. I mean, I don't know. I'll have to adjust it a little bit. Um, maybe on this side. So Joanna's playing with settings that control how uh, dark the background is. So you don't want the background to be too bright because then it overwhelms the galaxy. And so you control what you call the black level, how, how black should the background be. And then there's another control for how intense the bright area should be. And those are two of the basic controls you try to use to bring the thing out, which takes an awful lot of experimentation. All right. But, so uh, this... this camera. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you were talking about the camera. Go ahead. So this, this camera and this program are really uh, very well suited to this kind of thing. So as you can see, it doesn't take very, very long to get something uh, quite nice. This program is very sophisticated called Sharkcap. This is written by some person just for like out of love, for fun. This costs almost nothing, really. You can buy it for nothing, get it for nothing. It's next to no, no cost. And uh, this is one thing about amateur astronomy. You get people who are very clever, very um, capable, and they'll create things like this software, for example, that other people can use to do really cool things. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. It, astrophot astrophotography. I'm not. I'm definitely not as good at it. I'm definitely an amateur astrophotographer for sure. Uh, I've made a few images by combining things, but um, but it is really fun just to see it come out when you when you process them and because the raw images so we normally don't th this isn't our main camera this is a color camera our main camera is our uh, monochrome is a monochrome camera where we um, where we put filters in front of it in order to get uh, a, a red green and blue channel and then we combine them afterwards and the raw images look very unimpressive but then when you actually process them um, the detail that comes out is amazing can we, can we show can we show my m51 yes yes let's show your m51 because this is a little it, bit sent it to you where did it go let me see it would it be okay if i show my website where i have my all my pictures are yes uh, why don't we do that okay third it'll be on your web website i'm sorry i mean once you get into this thing you become kind of crazy about it, so yeah, let me try. Ahead. So this is should be uh, if I can get it right. Uh, Astro bin. This is a website that is used by thousands of amateur astrophotographers. This thing is really amazing uh, as a resource to go to. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can get my thing. So that should be. Okay, uh, while you're going that. there, I'm going to talk a little bit about M51. So M51, as Howard said, is a um, grand design spiral galaxy. And it's, a, it's a kind of a typical, it's got these beautiful spiral arms, right? Um, so they, the arms are being pulled tidally on one side because of that interaction with that little, that little galaxy that, that, um, that Howard talked about. Um, it's, about it's, it's about 30 million light years away, so kind of far. Um, but actually, well, I mean, that might sound far to you, but, but in honest, in all honesty, it's really just in our backyard. It is actually pretty close to us in comparison with the rest of the universe. <laughs> it's about, it's not as massive as the Milky Way. It's only about, you know, a tenth of the mass of our galaxy. Um, and what's cool about it is that it has an active galactic nucleus so it's got a little bit of a, a little bit it's got a black hole in the center of the galaxy All, most but we think that most galaxies do have uh, an incredibly massive black hole that astronomers call supermassive black holes like we really seriously abbreviate it s m b h supermassive black hole and um so as I was telling you, astronomers don't have real creative names for things, but SMBH, <laughs> supermassive black hole. So we think that most galaxies do have um, a supermassive black hole in the centers of their of their galaxies. And the Milky Way has one about um, uh, a few million solar masses um, in in mass inside Paltry. the center of our. Excuse me. Paltry. 
Tall tree, that's right. Yeah. It's actually really, it's, it actually is relatively small compared to other galaxies of our, the same mass. Uh, galaxies of the same mass tend to have, um, you know, a, a bit bigger uh, supermassive black holes than, than ours. So ours has not been terribly active. It hasn't been eating a lot of material um, in its history. But actually, when, so this, this galaxy has one. This galaxy has a supermassive black hole. And um, it, it does, it, the, the black holes do scale with the mass of the galaxy. So if it's a tenth of the mass of the Milky Way, it's probably got something like a tenth of the solar mass of the, of the black hole, but probably a little bit more because ours is a little bit small. But that black hole has a, um, is, is eating material at the moment and, and has, and it's, it's actually um, a little bit active. It's not hugely active, but it is a little bit active and it's, it's eating material. And that, and that process of eating material creates a little bit of light, so, which we can see in other galaxies. So um, this galaxy uh, apparently contains the first known extragalactic exoplanet candidate uh, detected by observing eclipsing sources. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's not known that it's like, you know, the, 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 the error bars are quite large. That it's a little bit uncertain, but it's, it's a probable, it's like a, it could actually be attributed to an exoplanet in this, in this particular galaxy. So it's near enough that we can see that. And Absolutely. other cool things, there's so many cool things about this galaxy. The spiral arms, we can't really see it right right now, but actually, do you have your picture, Howard? Okay. Thank you for asking, Joanna. So, uh, okay, so this is this website wow. called Astro. Whoops, Beautiful. sorry, I keep, I, keep, I keep... I saw a glimpse of it. it there it uh, is. Okay. So this is astrobin.com slash user slash slash h trash me. And so these are the images I've been taking at this, uh, uh, with this telescope uh, in uh, mine in California. And... The very first thing that I shot with my telescope in the Okanagan and the very first thing that I shot with this telescope is the whirlpool because it's such a beautiful object. And, uh, oops, let me try. And... I'm kind of being a klutz with my mouse. Okay, so. Wow, that's beautiful. So there it is. And you can you can zoom into this thing Okay, let's, let's move it over a little bit to the right of the screen so yeah, people can I'll see it down. better. There we go. And uh, wow. a, a testament to how, how good this location is and how good my telescope is. This is from only, you, you already get the impression from the images that we're taking with this uh, uh, live stacking. The longer you stack, the more you get. And this is only three hours of imaging with this telescope. And so... Uh, that was my first uh, my first go to object, and so again here you can see the spiral arms in a lot of detail, and there's that companion galaxy that's being ripped apart. And Joanna was mentioning tidal tails, so you see all this sort of gaseous stuff kind of being left behind as this galaxy is being pulled into the whirlpool. The whirlpool shape is also distorted. If you look at this spiral arm, it kind of wraps around too far compared to the ones that are closer into the center, and that's because this galaxy is being yanked to the left by its companion. So wow. that kind of tidal disruption can lead to really beautiful, beautiful objects uh, like uh, like this one. And there are other things you can see like in the background, here's a tiny little galaxy. This would be a spiral kind of similar in sh roughly in shape to this one. But this one is viewed uh, from the side edge on, so a thin little pencil shape. So this is probably, uh, this one's probably, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 times farther away than this one because it's, I don't know, 10 times smaller than that. So this is, you know, 20 million light years. This is maybe 200 million light years away. Wow. Anyway, that's, beautiful. that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's gorgeous. Cool. So one of the cool things that I like about this galaxy is that you can see the dust in the spiral arms as well as the blue stars. And if you'll notice, the dust is all on the inside of the spiral arms instead of the outside. And that actually confirms one of the theories of spiral arms and why, why stars form in spiral arms. And um, so what, how it works is that star, well, gas, clouds of gas, 
um, orbit the center of the, the galaxy because, it, you know, gravity, right? <laughs> so things orbit if there's gravity. And so when clouds of gas move around and they hit a spiral arm, a spiral arm is, is, is not really a solid thing. It's just kind of like a, a density wave, kind of like when you have a traffic jam on a highway. That traffic jam is not really a solid thing. It's made of cars that are just close together, but cars eventually move through the jam and keep on going. But the jam itself, that density bit, kind of stay, looks like it stays foot put, even though the cars themselves are moving. That's kind of what these spiral arms are. And when a cloud of gas um, orbits and hits a, a spiral arm, then, then, it, then it causes the gas to collapse and form new stars. And when the, the youngest stars are all blue, they're at least they're massive ones, they're youngest and they're and the massive and they're blue. And so that's, so you see them just outside the dust arm because they had just moved through the spiral arm and they were just born. So it was kind of a nice little confirmation of one of those theories. So I thought that's just one of my favorite little things to notice about, about spiral arms when you can see that much detail at least. <laughs> so that is M51. Oh, look at that. We're already at 2.15, 10.15. We probably should move on to our next target. Yeah, let's let's get rid of that. And that took, okay. Okay, so <laughs> compared to that image, <laughs> let's move on to Whoa, another one. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. That, that's far from city lights, the other one. Yeah. Yes, of course. Of Literally course, it's not comparable because we've only done it for like 11 minutes and, and, and yeah, on a camera. There, from, yeah, from, from, with a big light light shining near the telescope, so That's it's right. not not a fair comparison by any, by any means. Not a comparison by any means, but the next one's kind of cool. So the next one, whoops, not this. Uh, the next one I wanted to show you is a galaxy that we're going to see somewhat edge on, and it is also interacting with another galaxy, which is causing a huge starburst in the center of it. And this is going to be, so we're going to look at M82. M82. It is a beautiful galaxy. April is actually the best month to see it because it's really high in the sky. Um, I'll show you where it is. There it is. It's really high, near, not too far from the zenith. Um, there is the North Star, Polaris, and so it's high, it's kind of right now, it's above. So, you know, as I said, it is also circumpolar, as I said, remember, circumpolar are things that, that never set below the horizon because they're too close to the North Pole, and North Star, and M82 is one of them, and so it just circles around. But now, April is about the best time to see it because in the early evening, which is 10 p.m., early evening, it's uh, up pretty, it's like the highest point that it gets in our sky. So let's take a look at it. And let me pull up my settings for M82. I don't think they're going to be terribly different from this. There it is! Look at that! And here is the lamp in the north. <laughs> oh well. But we can still see, look at that, that's M82. Okay, I hope it stacks. Please stack. It is! It's stacking! Good. Dang, that looks nice. So um, there is still a little bit of glare from that lamp there in the north, because it is to the north of the observatory. So yeah, somebody did mention, why don't we ask SFU to take it down? Good question. <laughs> 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 well, you know, the truth is uh, campus safety is important, and that's something that we have to respect. And um, yeah, but it would be nice to be able to to be able to do both, right? Like have a safe campus and also a nice view of M82. <laughs> so this is it M82. Can be done. It can... Pardon me? It can be done. Uh, it can be done. But, uh, yeah. It can yeah. be done. That's right. Yes. And we're going to work on that. We have been trying to work on some of these things. 
Okay, so what is Amity 2? Amity 2 is a Star Wars Galaxy. As I said, it is, it is, we're looking at it more like edge on the plate. Like a, you know, the spiral galaxy that we just saw, M51, we're looking at it from, you know, the side, like face on. Now we're looking at a galaxy edge on because we're looking at on the edge. And this galaxy is uh, is cool because it's got it's a it's a starburst galaxy. So it is it has a massive amount of star formation in the center of the galaxy, the core of the galaxy, and it's giving off these huge plumes of um, outflow, like an outflowing gas. And the star formation rate is something like ten times higher than than um, than normal for this for this type of galaxy. So our galaxy is forming stars at a rate of something like you know one to three uh, stellar solar masses per year, and this galaxy is forming stars at ten times that at least. And um, so it's it's a really strong starburst, and the reason is because uh, the inter this galaxy is interacting with a nearby galaxy, M eighty one. It's interacting, and those the gravitational interactions, like it's it's kind of, um, you know, those gravitational interactions cause the gas in the galaxy to funnel towards the center of the galaxy, and form uh, uh, form stars in the center. That you know, because the gravitational interactions cause the instability of the gas, and and you know, the gas would normally be orbiting the galaxy, but in in nice circles. But because of the instability of the gravitational interaction with the other galaxy, the gas just funnels all the way into the center, um, creating a starburst, and possibly also feeding the black hole. Uh, but we're not actually sure because the signal of star formation is so strong that it might be masking the black hole if it's being active right now. So we can't, can't really tell for sure. But yeah, that is M82. It's also in our neighborhood. It's not that far away. It's only 12 million light years away. <laughs> um, this galaxy, another fun fact about this galaxy is that there was a little supernova that was discovered recently in this in this galaxy. And there's a there's a really cool animation online. Um, little GIF. I don't know if I can find that. Um, uh, let's look it up here. M82 super nova but there's a I think there's a there was one okay here's a good picture so there was a supernova recently discovered there it was only a few years ago and um, that was in this galaxy so <laughs> it's actually not too bad of a comparison these the two picture looks just, almost the same it's just the background of the, the from the light from that lamp but yeah, it looks it would have been right about over here. So that is M82. Discovered in 2014. Thank you, Rohit. 2014 was the was the supernova. It is really cool too because you can see the ripples of the uh, the light echo of the supernova propagate through it. Now I have to find that that gif would be so cool to show you. I don't think it's there. I showed it to my class this year and it was so cool that I should show it to you as well. Where is it? I don't know. I don't know where I put it. Maybe I should grab my slime. <laughs> uh, well that's okay. Let's just enjoy the image of M92 while I t try to see if I can find it. It was, a, oh, it was a Hubble, Hubble had, had measured the, the expanding of the, the rays of light coming from the supernova and expanding through the galaxy. Oh, this is it. It's not an animation, but this will be good. See, look at that. So it went supernova in 2014 in November, and then the light from the supernova spread out, which is really cool because we know that the speed of light travels at a certain speed. We know what the speed of light is. And so if you know how much time it took to get this far, then you know how far that distance is from the supernova. And so if you know that distance, 
then you can do some triangulation and you know the distance to this galaxy. So that's kind of cool. I mean, we already kind of had other ways to measure the distance to this galaxy, but this gave us a really, really precise measure of the distance to M82. So that's, that was really, really cool to uh, when Hubble discovered this. So anyways, that was M82. Oh my goodness, we only have five minutes left. Should we, let's see, what else did we have on this list? I mean, we don't have to see all of it. Oh, but you know what? I think it would be really worth seeing the sombrero because the sombrero is pretty impressive. So I think we should go see the sombrero. What do you think, Howard? Sounds good. All right. The sombrero is another galaxy that's really interesting because not only is it shaped like a sombrero, but it is an elliptical galaxy. So I didn't tell you, there are basically two types of galaxies. One of them is very much like the spiral galaxy that we saw M51 with the beautiful spiral arms. And there are other types of galaxies that are called elliptical galaxies, which do not have spiral arms. They're shaped like balls, like balls of stars. And in fact, they're, they're called elliptical, <laughs> you know, or spherical, not quite spherical, but they're elliptical. And they're, so they're called elliptical galaxies. And they don't usually have they're usually red because they have old stars and they don't have young stars. And they usually don't have any dust. Remember in M51, we saw dust on the insides of the spiral arms. So basically, dust correlates with star formation. You need to have dust in order to form new stars. And elliptical galaxies tend not to have any new stars and they also tend not to have any dust. But this one is a very interesting galaxy because it has dust, and yet it's an elliptical galaxy. <laughs> so let's take a look at the sombrero. We can't really see the elliptical part very well with this camera, but but we can see the, the dust disk, which is... Dust, which is the good. dust lane is uh, awesome, yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look. And we're looking near the south, so it should be... Should be a decent view. You can uh, tell the dust. You can see the dust lane uh, even in a pretty small telescope by eyeball. Uh, uh, there it is, everybody. Yeah, the sombrero is really fun. It is a fun galaxy. Okay, so let's hope it stacks. Yes, it's stacking. Wow, look at the dust. Dang. Look at that. Isn't that cool? That's amazing. You can see the dust blocking the uh, the galaxy. So the galaxy is, so if you had, if we had a longer exposure, you could see the elliptical galaxy all the way around it. And this, this dust lane is, so the fact that it's, there's dust around an elliptical galaxy very likely means that it just recently experienced a merger with a spiral galaxy that had dust in it. So that is that is a likely explanation for why this particular galaxy has dust. All right. The sombrero. Oh, cool. that's pretty. Very cool. Isn't that cool? So that's pretty. That's just two minutes. That's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. Oh, the ring in the supernova. Okay. Oh, Godwin is asking about the ring in the supernova that was shown. Um, and that, uh, how do we know it's light from the supernova? Because it was coming from the supernova. So it's light. I mean, everything that we detect in astronomy is light. So it's like, oh, I see what you mean. So why is it light and not like material from the blast? Uh, because, so what we're seeing is, um, light that is emanating. So there are periods in which you actually don't see the ring and that's because it's not actually shining on the surrounding dust. But once it shines on some dust, then it reflects and comes to us and that's why we're able to see the ring um, expanding. It's because of the dust that's around the supernova. But there are also moments when you don't see the ring and because there's no dust there. And so we know that it is light and not material from the, from the supernova. Why is dust important for star formation? Oh, great question. It's because uh, you need dust in order to, um, 
block light from stars in order to keep gas cold. So you need gas to be cold because if gas is hot, it means that the particles are moving around really quickly. And if they're moving around really quickly, then they won't gravitate towards each other uh, to form stars. So you need the gas to be cold, and in order for it to be cold, you need dust to block light from the surrounding stars. <laughs> so that's the short answer for why you need dust to form stars. Uh, yes, it is gas that makes the stars, but you need the dust to make it cold. Yeah, I hope that, that makes sense. So, this was Sombrero Galaxy. It was nice to end the night on that, hey? It's so pretty. Great, yeah, nice. So, wow, it's 10.30 already. Wow, short night. But it was so much fun. Thanks, Howard, for, for joining me, and thank all of you for joining me. This well, thanks for having really me. Uh... Joanna, I was, I was looking forward to hanging out. It was great. Yeah, this is really fun. So are there any last questions? I'll just scan the, the chat for now. Um, yes, the ring from the supernova is light scattered off of dust. That's right. Well, it was really fun chatting with you and, and looking at the sky with you all. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you again to Rohit, Rob, and Cooper for moderating. And uh, yeah, it was really fun, Howard. We yeah. should do this again. We definitely yeah. will not let you retire in peace. We need to have you back um, more often to be able to do things yeah, like this. Yeah, keep me on my toes. That'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks everyone. So I'm going to uh, close the stream now, but keep looking up, keep uh, looking at the sky, and especially this weekend, it's still gonna be um, clear. It's gonna be good weather. So, so look up at the sky, look at the stars, and keep um, dreaming and thinking about the universe. And join us again for another clear night whenever it's a nice, nice clear. Every Friday night uh, that's clear, we do have this event. So sometimes it'll be, it'll be different hosts every time, um, but, uh, but please join us for next time as well. Thank you and good night.